This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm executive director of the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. And this is the beginning of a new series that we call Book Worlds. I have here with me Chris McKinney, uh, the author of his seventh novel, Yakudoshi, The Age of Calamity. Uh, Chris is a very well-known writer here in Hawaii. His uh, previous titles are The Tattoo, Boy No Good, Queen of Tears, Bolohead Row, Mililani Mauka, and The Red-Headed Hawaiian. He's also written a couple of screenplays that we'll come to in a moment. He's been visiting distinguished <coughs> writer at UH Manoa, and he's a winner of the Elliot Cade's uh, Award for Literature, which is given to two people every year. He's the winner of six uh, Hawaii Publishers Association uh, Kapalapala Awards uh, uh, for Best Book of the Year. Uh, so, Chris, uh, let me ask you, first of all, what's the meaning of the title, Yakudoshi? Uh, Yakudoshi uh, is essentially, it's a, a, a Japanese thing, it's a Japanese cultural thing where uh, certain ages, when you reach uh, certain ages in your life, they're considered bad luck. And for men, uh, the biggest one is 41. And uh, the main character, Bruce Blank, who just got out of prison, is about to turn 41 years old. And when he comes out of prison, he finds himself immersed in Honolulu nightlife, and it does not resemble what he had remembered when he was a younger man. Uh, and the main, the other thing that he finds out, of course, is that his son, who he's never met, has gone missing. So in a lot of ways, this is sort of a, a no, uh, urban noir mystery in which the criminal or the ex-con is the one who is investigating the crime. What were you trying to do with the book? I, I think, well, the, the book, uh, the, first off, I mean, all the material for the book wasn't sought out intentionally. Uh, what had happened to me uh, in my own life is that I, uh, I was going through a, a divorce and I actually just found myself uh, going back to uh, this nightlife thing because I was newly single and I was curious and I wanted to see what was out there. And uh, I, I had done that for, for a couple of years and I, I felt like I, I learned a lot of, about it, but I wasn't necessarily to, to mine for material. Uh, what had happened was I met a girl. And the novel, in, in a lot of ways, is sim simply a, a novel-length love letter to the woman who is now my wife. Uh, I was showing off, essentially, and I'm showing her uh, the book as I wrote it, chapter by chapter. That's the most original love letter I've ever read. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the nightlife you refer to isn't the nightlife that you see advertised in the newspaper very much. No. Uh, tell us about it. <clears throat> it's, uh, in, the, in the book, it's, it's called uh, People Who Work industry and it's it's essentially the the world that I encountered was was very young um, it was very Asian American uh, I guess some people would say local Asian and it it, it was in some ways, and I don't want to, I never want to sound like a crotchety old man, one of those people who says, oh, you know, the kids today have changed, but I, I did notice that it was far more Americanized and uh, it was far more uh, hip cult, hip hop culture infused, and it was more materialistic and brand name uh, conscious. I would say, uh, cash conscious, and it uh, and the, the the drug scene was very different from what I had remembered, and it was very much uh, driven by. I, I hadn't seen that many, for example, pharmaceutical drugs before in my entire life. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And what kind of, <clears throat> tell us about some of the characters in the book. Yeah. Um, well, so, so Bruce is, of course, Bruce is the main character. He's the first person narrator uh, of the novel. And uh, he, uh, he meets uh, a girl uh, who is essentially the biggest drug dealer in town, in, in Honolulu. And she is not what uh, people would think of when they think of a sort of a drug kingpin. She's a, a tiny, skinny Korean girl. And it sort of blows his mind because what he had remembered uh, during his era was a stereotypical drug dealer it was all yoked out, uh, thick gold chains, and you know he had this. He rolled with a heavy crew, but 
Uh, it's just uh, this just very young girl that she seems to be running things in Honolulu. So that's uh, one of the other main characters in the novel. And the other one is a sort of uh, an old friend, someone who he knew back in high school who uh, is, is uh, in some ways a trust fund baby. And he, he hangs with these guys, just, just these, these guys who are uh, around the same age, around 41 years old, who maxed out on promotion, maxed out on salary, had their wives, got divorced, had kids, and they're hanging out at these bars because they just have no idea what they're supposed to do with, with their lives. Because suddenly, uh, today we find ourselves living much, much longer than we did in the past, and it feels like life uh, or society mapped out life for only X amount of years, and uh, maybe, you know, whatever, 100 years ago, 40-something was probably the life expectancy, and now it's 80. <laughs> and it's sort of, we still live based on that schedule, and you just have a lot of these, these people who are in their 40s uh, who I think feel lost in that way. The Troy character the, you, were just, yeah. you just referred to was, you say call him a trust fund, but he had, he had a very particular kind of trust fund. Can you yes, describe it? Yes, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you know, on the surface, it, it looks like that, that it's very simple that his dad was a, a very successful criminal attorney and he inherited a bunch of money. But what uh, his father, the backstory goes, is actually got himself in, in legal trouble uh, and sort of lost everything. So what he actually ended up inheriting is his father's uh, criminal connections. Was that modeled on anyone you know? Um, I've heard things, no. but I, I don't, I don't want to say it's, it's, it's mod modeled on anybody specific. Yeah. But it's one of those things that you, you sort of, you, you, especially when you live in a place like this, it's very small and, and you hear things or you hear about things that happen to, to people and it sparks something. But I, I don't think I ever sort of dig deeper into, and especially when it comes to fiction, is that's kind of like what I don't want to do. I don't want to write a character or create a character that is just purely based on somebody yeah. who, who actually exists. The, the narrator, the main character, uh -huh. uh, went to jail. Why did he go to jail? Um, drugs. Drugs. Right. And, and his, he went to jail for a long time. Uh, he went to jail for and he went to federal prison. <clears throat> so the, and that's sort of the, what happens. I mean, that kind of crime is, is, is a federal crime. And when you are when you are arrested and when you are convicted of a, a drug charge, for example, uh, you serve time in federal prison, and federal prison is different from state prison, right? Because with federal prison, you pretty much serve all of the time that you're sentenced. You hear about state prisons and overcrowding and, and issues in which an, an inmate can get out, get early release. Uh, but with federal prison, the the budget is the uh, pretty much endless, so they, they can totally make you do all of the time that you were wow, sentenced. Wow. Well, when he, was, uh, when he was there, he learned to speak in a different way. Yeah. Um, it's one of the most remarkable aspects of the book, is the language. Mm, thank you. And, and uh, can you tell us about that? Because it's not language you hear every day. It's, yeah, it's not. And I, I think that a, a lot of it, uh, it's uh, what I would call, it's sort of like urban youth language. Mm -hmm. And because he went to federal prison in California, it's not, it's not like his, as if his peers are local guys from Hawaii. So he, he learned that language from just this, just this large body of people who are, who are young and who got busted selling drugs and who are sort of from all over the place uh, in the United States. And I think that the language, even, even with the characters who exist in, in that industry, in that bar industry, sort of... It, uh, speak with this sort of almost like raised on on YouTube and and Jay Z and Dr. Dre kind of and Beyonce and Rihanna kind of thing where it's uh, it's interesting and you know the, a lot of the words are new and a lot of the words are created by these these artists uh, in in their songs and in in neighborhoods that are so far away from this one so you know a word might have originated say uh, so, somewhere uh, like. Brooklyn, and now everybody uses that that word. Can you give some examples? Well, I, I guess uh, my favorite word in in the novel uh, is is ratchet, <laughs> and you How hear you that. Um, in the book, I spell it R A C H E T, and it is also the name of Troy's bo uh, boat. And uh, the, the way he has it spelled on his boat is R H R A C H three, 
uh, you know, the backwards three and, and T. And I think that was one of the first words. And it sounds so silly because I'm sure that if you, you know, young people are listening to this, they're thinking that word's been around forever. But for me, when I was coming out, it was the first word that I'd heard in a bar. And I said, wait, what is that? And when I heard uh, the definition, it, it just sort of cracked me up that it just seemed so out of left field for me. And as I got more and more familiar uh, with that culture, I, I noticed that it was just, it was used constantly. Oh. Well, the book even has a glossary, which yes. I, I don't think yeah. I've seen many novels with glossaries. And the glossary is by no means complete. No, uh, no. And glossaries are tough that way. Yeah. It's sort of you, you start taking for granted what words might, might be known by a general public. And what, it, it's, it, was, it was tricky to oh. make, decide which words to put in there and which to leave out. One of the surprises, there are a lot of surprises in this book. Um, and obviously, you like surprising the reader. Uh, is that the, this criminal becomes a, essentially a detective. Uh -huh. uh, tell us about that. <clears throat> well, it, the, the idea was that his, um, his son, when he comes out, he discovers that his son has gone missing, and there may be police involvement with the crime. So it's sort of like as this guy, as this sort of, this, just this, this ex-con, this hood, how do you go about solving this mystery when the police not not only don't probably don't aren't interested in helping you because it's such a it's such an old case, but what if they're involved as well? He's almost he's almost forced to make the decision that he has to do this on his own. Remind us what the crime was. Um, that that the, the, the kidnapping. kidnapping. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So his his son, um, mm -hmm. he he is uh, at first uh, he he finds out what he he believes happened is his son is dead um, and then what as he digs into it more and more is what he fi finds out is that his the, the kid has had been kidnapped and he doesn't know he doesn't know if the kid is alive or dead he doesn't know and it doesn't know what happened and that's essentially the what drives the plot in the story is this discovery and this just refusal to quit uh, he just refuses to give up and he uh, he risks everything to, to find out uh, which he does at the end. I was very struck by, the, the, as a lot of readers have been, about the amount of violence, mm -hmm. and, uh, which was pretty casually mm -hmm. applied. Um, but it occurred to me that it's quite analogous to the violence you see on, on uh, um, not Hawaii Five O, but yes, oh, Hawaii Five O, uh, which is almost like another form of vigilante mm -hmm. violence. But uh, in, in, in your book, it's not a moral issue ever, really. It's, no. It, it's, no. It's just what you do. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, especially if, if you, I mean, the talk about it in the context of something like, like 5 -0. I actually met uh, Peter Lenkoff, who's the um, executive producer, showrunner uh, of 5 -0, and uh, his his description of, of 5 -0 is is great to me. I mean, it's just this... Uh, he has this childhood memory of, of growing up in in Minnesota, and you know coming and being home, and his and it's freezing, and his dad would be on on his barca lounger and would crack open a beer, and he would just sit uh, at his dad's knee, and this is the time that they would spend together, just watching, watching to escape the the bitter cold of, of that area, the United States, and and he said that, that I mean that's really what. The heart of part of what the, uh, maybe the heart of Five O is is it's this it's this popcorn thing, this thing that is supposed to be uh, entertaining and is supposed to allow escape. And uh, it, he does a fantastic job at it. If you watch that guy in action, man, that's a smart guy. Uh, really well, impressive. we'll just take a break. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best You can be the king, come laying on your chest You can beat the world, you can beat the war You could touch a flag, go banging on his door You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock You can move a mountain, you can break rocks You can be a master, don't wait for luck Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself in the
you. Kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Chris, uh, you're now adapting the book into um, a te television series. Yeah. Tell me, how how did you get into that? <clears throat> well, I've always I've always sort of chased the notion of wanting to uh, transition into working specifically on TV series, and what really sparked that was The Wire, which just blew my mind. Uh -huh. um, but with with this book, what had happened was I, I have a good friend. His name is uh, James Serino, and he owns a production company here called Kinetic Productions. And we've worked together in the past. We've done a feature film together. And I would showed him the book, and we started talking, and we, we he really liked it, and he was he wanted to adapt it in some way to film. And what I suggested was let's maybe make it a limited series, just a one shot story, and we'll cut it up into six episodes that run roughly 50 some odd minutes. So what I did was I, I took the book and I adapted it into, into the screen or tele, teleplay version. And uh, we uh, went and we shopped it in, in LA. We, we attached uh, talent to it. Uh, a friend of mine, is, uh, his name is Soon Kang, and he's uh, very much known, known for being the, the Asian presence in the Fast and Furious movies. And, uh, Justin Chan as well uh, agreed to be a part of it, and Justin uh, was in, in a number of the Twilight movies, and he also uh, produced a movie called uh, Gook, which uh, recently uh, did very well at Sundance and won audience awards. So we took this project and we found a, a partner in LA, a production company, and we're sort of we're at that place where we're waiting to hear back and, and see what happens. Well, um, one of the challenges, I imagine, is how you deal with a narrator, because the book is written in the first person. Yeah, yeah. How do you do that with a television series? It was, uh, and it was, and it was something that uh, we knew that we had to deal with right off the bat before I even just started adapting it. And we, we talked about whether or not, do we want to do voiceover? Do we want to do that kind of stuff? Or do we want to uh, peel it apart and, and, and create it in a more objective way? And uh, what we decided it was is we decided against the voiceover, and it was it was a, a bit of a challenge because the I feel like the voice in the novel um, very much drives drives the narrative. Uh, with the w with the screenplay version, uh, I didn't have as much of that, but what it did allow me to do is it allowed me to explore uh, other characters more deeply uh, because the novel is so first person centric it's difficult to do so and there's a rhythm to the book but with the screenplay version and because I expanded it to six episodes uh, the Olive character the Troy character it gave me more time to sort of flesh out and develop those characters. Oh neat. Um, the book is full of surprises obviously you enjoy surprising yeah. the reader. Uh, I find myself quite often thinking I was going down one road and then <laughs> yeah. uh, going into another one. Um, Probably the most surprising was the ending, which is mm -hmm. a happy ending. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a book you'd expect to see a happy ending in. Mm -hmm. What led you to that? A surprise. Uh, um, yeah. And it's, it's, yeah, and it's funny because I don't know how much my, my current mood has to do with sort of the way I end stories or my current just emotional being. Um, uh, with this book, I, I was, I, I just, I had a lot of fun writing it, and it was a sort. It was a good time in my life, and I, I mean, I don't know how much of that optimism sort of bubbled over <laughs> in the narrative as I, I was I was writing it, um, but I, I, and especially with this character, I mean, I, I felt a, a bond with this particular character because, to be honest, I mean, that we have similarities, uh, the, and. I, you find, or I, I found myself in a position where, and I wanted things to go good for this guy. No, I think you're right. It's, yeah. it's actually, when I think about it, it's a cheerful book. Yeah. You know, you don't feel depressed by a lot of depressing stuff. I, uh, yeah. It's, it's uh, has so much energy going for it. Thank you. So, uh, are you going to? You've done seven novels. What's, uh -huh. what's any more in the? In the making or um, not distance? right now so I'm just I'm focusing on the on the screenplay stuff the adaptation stuff and I'm also trying to write new material so uh, my friend and I because 
because the process is about sort of pitching and waiting, pitching and waiting, what we're trying to do is we're trying to fill that sort of waiting period with productivity. So I'm throwing around other ideas. We, uh, we did shoot a short film in December, and we're, hopefully we're going to shoot something else uh, this, by the end of this year. So right now I'm sort of looking at a, a possible uh, another short film or a, a feature film and, uh, or an indie feature film. So it's just continually trying to come up with ideas and write new material so that, uh, so that I, I'm not sort of stuck in a holding pattern uh, waiting for somebody to green light me to work. So I just try to continually work. But meanwhile, you have a day job. I do. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm an English professor at, at Honolulu <laughs> Community College. Uh, the great thing about that job is the, the flexibility, I think. Um, because one of the difficult things that I've experienced, and I'm, sure, I'm guessing that a lot of other writers experience it as well, is, is when you can do this work. Uh, I would have a very difficult time doing this kind of stuff after I had completed a, a nine to five shift somewhere. I just feel depleted. Uh, but with the job that I have, um, where I have flexibility with my schedule, I can wake up, I can do this then I can, I can teach, and then if I have to grade papers, for example, I can do that at 7 p.m. if I want to. So, but you do have to show up to class. But I do have to show up, show up to class. Yeah, and half of, actually, half of my courses are delivered through the internet, and it's been like that oh. for, for years now. So I don't, I don't feel um, over, overwhelmed that with, with well? on-campus classwork. Yeah, it does. I, there, there are... There are certainly, like anything else, pluses and minuses, but as far as schedule flexibility, it is definitely an advantage. Oh. Yeah. So how, how, how does that work? In t they have to show up at a t particular no. time or not? No, it's, it's just, it's basically... So it's a canned lecture? It's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, so you, do, you have a lecture, you have all of the sort of the course materials, and mm -hmm. you have them go through it, and then you have them respond to the course materials to make sure that, of course, that they, they not only read it, but they, they can comp they, they're comprehending it. And so, I mean, and it is, a, uh, most of these courses are composition courses anyway, and I teach creative writing as well. Um, so really, the, the lar a large part of the content, just like as, as I teach it in the classroom, is student writing. So it's just uh, going over their work individually and having them rework you it. Find rework any writers? Uh, there's always and there's always there's always a a couple of a couple of uh, talented talented people yeah. in, in in classes. Um, and then there are, are of course understandably so. Uh, the majority are just they need the credit, <laughs> and yeah. it's just it's sort of uh, trying to. I guess that one of the challenges of teaching. Uh, these courses on the internet is to present it in uh, and a, as interesting of a manner as I can in person, uh, because of the fact that it, it can it can a lot of the material can appear very sort of dry in written form. Even if you if you you know have YouTube clips and all of that kind of stuff, there isn't some somebody there. There isn't somebody there present to sort you of. You have them read your books? Uh, never, never, never. I I, I just feel I, I don't know why they just. It gives me this sort of, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I just read have them a problem. Anyway? I, I, I hope so, but I certainly, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I would not ever want to assign no. a student of mine uh, my own book. But do they ever give you feedback anyhow on your they, book? They do, and, and, I, and I, never, I never tell them, it's, hey, it's me, you know, I wrote this and that or the other thing, but uh, some students uh, are aware of the fact that, that I had written uh, some of these books and some of the students uh, like the books, so I, uh, they come up to me maybe, I get approached after class and they tell me that they, they really liked what I wrote and it's, it's always very, very flattering mm -hmm. and I'm appreciative. Look, looking back on it's now seven books. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite? No, uh, I, 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 can, I there, there's one. There's something about each book that maybe makes it memorable for me, but I wouldn't categorize it as a, a list of favorites from from least to, to or from best to worst. Uh, I guess an example would be the first book, The Tattoo. All I'll always sort of approve because it was the first. I had no idea what I was doing. And I remember, I remember going through that process with somebody who just had no clue, and I'll never sort of forget it. And I don't say that in, as it, it was a negative experience; it's a positive one. Yeah. It was just it was so it, it was so 
interesting. I mean, it's just to do something that I just I just did not know really or understand how what to do it. What were the main lessons you learned from that? Um, <clears throat> I think that I I um, I there are certain basics that I just really it took me a while to sort of get down. This is simple things like description. Um, Things like pacing, things, th these are things that I had to sort of, I had to work on uh, time and time, and I had to really take my time with because it was just, I just wasn't experienced. Um, but, but yeah, so it, it's almost as if the, the, one of the large lessons I learned from that first one was just the sort of uh, stylistic and mechanical issues that, that come up with, with uh, novel or with fiction writing. Um, and as, as I sort of, if you get closer to sort of the last books that I wrote, uh, sometimes the challenge is not to forget uh, what I did with that first book. Anyway, I just told a story. And uh, I just tried to tell a good story. And sometimes I, I, I really try to stop myself from getting wrapped up in, in the sort of the Does literary qualities or the symbolism or the... Does the, it get easier? Uh, never. Never. Does um, it get harder? It's you uh, know, you set the set the bar higher. Yeah, yeah. If anything, it it is it is harder. Uh, I can do certain things probably more more quickly, mm -hmm. um, but it is is harder because it's never. It's not as if I I thought about this you know twenty things while writing the first one, and now I only think about five. It's always it's always twenty. It's always a hundred things. You do a lot of rewriting. I do, a, I do, I know I'm finished with a, a first draft when the very thought of reading it again almost <laughs> makes me physically ill. So yeah, there's, it's up yeah. to that point I, and it's necessary. Do you rewrite as you go along or do you do the whole draft and then um, start over again? Yeah. Typically I, I try to create markers um, because I don't want to get, I don't want to get obsessed with page one, page one, page, so it's sort of, let's say that I do, and it depends on what the book is, but if I get through maybe 20 pages, then I'll say, okay, this is a good time to sort of stop and look back and go through it again. Um, so I, I try to set these, these rules for myself so that, that help me, um, but don't hinder me in finishing a project. Because I've seen writers do that, uh, get caught up in, in the fine tuning and the perfection to the point where they have a difficult time uh, completing a narrative. Uh, well, thank you, Chris. You oh, certainly haven't you. had a problem finishing this one. So <laughs> no, I, thank you very much. So that's, uh, thanks for coming. And thank that's you, Roger. the end of this session. Okay. Aloha. <laughs>